Okay. Welcome everyone. Thanks for joining us today. My name is Megan Pistoles. I'm the Education and Outreach Coordinator with the St. Lawrence Eastern Lake Ontario Partnership for Regional Invasive Species Management, or SLILO PRISM for short. SLILO was one of eight PRISMs funded by the Environmental Protection Fund that span the state of New York. And we are in an integrative approach to invasive species management, prevention, and outreach. Today's presentation is going to begin with an overview of Watertown's Arboretum. We will also give a live virtual tour of a story map that can be accessed online that guides a tour of the trees in the Arboretum. There will also be a volunteer opportunity to help protect trees in Watertown. Then we will discuss a few invasive pests that threaten urban forests in our region along with Watertown's response to emerald ash borer and ways to enhance urban forests health in the path of invasive species and climate change. Continuing education credits are available for SAF, CNLP, and credits are pending for ISA. Now I'd like to introduce our first speaker, Mike DeMarco. He is an ISA certified arborist and acts as a city planner with the City of Watertown Office of Planning and Community Development. He is going to begin our discussion with an overview of Watertown's Arboretum and the benefits that urban forests provide. Hello everyone. To thank you all for being here on this, this wonderful um, webinar opportunity. I'd like to thank Megan and the folks at SLILO for, for really getting this going and and um, putting something really nice to, together here. Um, so we're looking at, we're speaking right now about a, a downtown arboretum. Um, I think it would be important to first kind of define what an arboretum is. In, in short, an arboretum is a collection of living trees, uh, a tree museum, if you, if you will. Um, and that is uh, used for recreational or educational purposes. And we're really, we really feel fortunate uh, to have such a unique gem in in downtown Watertown. Um, this, uh, this Arboretum was first developed and established just a few years after uh, the ice storm of 1998 really decimated um, Watertown's urban forest. Um, established in 2003 by members of Tree Watertown, uh, which is the, the city's street tree advisory board. Um, they, they noticed at that time that trees that had survived the ice storm, there was a really diverse and unique group of trees in the 200 block of, of Washington Street. Um, this arboretum is made up of over 100 trees and over 35 different varieties and species, um, which is quite exciting and really nice to have, uh, again, in such a small area. And just a little bit of a, just a little bit of a, uh, I guess, a, a non-humble brag. Uh, we we're very, very excited last year to uh, to make the cover of City Trees magazine. This is the journal for the Society of Municipal Arborists. It's uh, this is viewed globally, and um, so yeah, Watertown's downtown arboretum made made the cover shot. So very exciting stuff. It's important to to define urban forest. Um, you know, it's not just street trees. A lot, of, a lot of times we, um, we, we think of um, street trees when, when we think of urban trees, and that is, um, that's really not quite true. A large percentage of any urban forest uh, is made up of trees behind the sidewalk on private property. And that's uh, this segment of the city's urban forest, the downtown Arboretum is no, is no different. This really is a private public partnership between city of Watertown and four or five uh, neighboring property owners. Um, the Watertown Daily Times, the property where the Masonic Temple is sits, the Jefferson County Historical Society, uh, Community Bank, and the former Agricultural Insurance Building, which is now owned by Washington Street Apartments or Washington Street Properties. Um, this is a this is a really unique uh, partnership because you know, you're not always invited onto your neighbor's property <laughs> to, to enjoy their, their trees. And in this setting, you're absolutely invited and encouraged to, uh, to explore the properties 
and to enjoy the trees. Um, some quick benefits um, that urban trees have, and especially highlighting the Arboretum here, um, trees within our Arboretum, they, uh, they help to minimize the urban heat island effect of downtowns through shading and their evaporative cooling effect um, really makes, uh, really helps to make this, this portion of, of downtown tolerable during those uh, 90 degree drought stricken weeks. Um, the trees within the Arboretum also minimize um, peak stormwater fl uh, runoff flow, which uh, inevitably runs into the Black River, which is just uh, one or two blocks north of, of the Arboretum. Uh, each large maturing tree can, you know, can, really, can really hold quite a bit of uh, water during those, those peak flows on their leaves, stems, branches, and, and trunk, and then eventually um, uptaking through the root system. These trees produce valuable uh, wildlife habitat uh, for our urban wildlife, for our pollinators and our furry and flying neighbors, um, which is really great when you have a downtown that's teeming with, with life. Uh, it makes for a, uh, an exciting place to be. Of course, the obvious benefit would be the, the aesthetics. Uh, the trees within downtown, with Watertown's downtown Arboretum help to make downtown Watertown a beautiful place to, to be. Um, and one benefit that is really a combination of a couple of these is the economic benefit. Through the shading and evaporative cooling effect and the beauty of, of these trees, um, right here in a, in a downtown economic center, uh, this is a perfect recipe for individuals to linger longer, even during a time of COVID, it's okay, wear your mask. Uh, this, this equates to increased purchases during shopping trips. Uh, you might you might go get a coffee on your way to getting a sandwich, um, hang out on a, on a park bench and uh, meeting a friend for, for a beer later. Things like, like, like that is just a, uh, it's just a great thing, which makes this a really great setting for the city's um, farm and, and craft market, which is nestled in, uh, in the street margin of the 200 block of, of Washington Street right here in, in the Arboretum. Um, I, whenever I get an opportunity to speak about the uh, Tree City U USA, um, I like to. Um, you know, when you're associated or affiliated with, with a community that is uh, a Tree City USA, that means you're a part of a community that cares, um, that's actually trying to do something um, meaningful with, within, the, within the community that, that is, not always, is not always noticed. But um, if you take a walk or, or a drive around the city of Watertown, you will, you will notice a, a garden of trees. On, on most every street within our parks and within, within our playgrounds. Um, just some of the, the uh, annual criteria, uh, a municipality will have to um, spend $2 per capita uh, for tree planting and, and maintenance, uh, as, well have, as well as have an active street tree advisory board or shade committee um, to help guide the city in making choices uh, and, and, and decisions tree related. Uh, you have to have an active tree ordinance, which is local law dictating the maintenance and preservation of your trees, um, as well as uh, celebrate Arbor Day annually here. And you can see this, this, uh, this uh, Tree City USA flag uh, flying proudly here. Um, um, just a couple opportunities for folks that might want to um, help support the, uh, the, the city's urban forestry program, you can contact me or you can contact a member of our, of our street tree advisory board um, to attend a tree water town meeting. Uh, you can also attend one of our biannual tree planting projects. Um, and you could also adopt a tree to, ha to have one planted in your front yard as part of the city's annual spring tree planting program. If you are interested in that, please reach out to me with my contact information um, at the end of this uh, presentation. Okay, perfect. Thank you, Mike. You're very uh, if, any, if anybody does have any questions, uh, please feel free to unmute yourself or utilize the chat box. You can unmute yourself by selecting the microphone or the chat icon, which can be located by hovering over the bottom of the screen with your mouse if you are on a computer. Or look for three dots on your screen to select the option from a drop down menu if you are on a mobile device. Um, I just wanted to let folks know about that. Not everybody is um, well rehearsed with Zoom, I've learned. So um, I will check the chat box real quick just to see 
if there were any questions so far or if folks want to unmute themselves they can go ahead and do that as well okay, i'm not seeing anything right now so i will proceed Okay, so now we're going to provide a virtual tour of the Watertown's Arboretum through a live demonstration of the downtown Arboretum story map, which showcases over 35 different tree species that make up the Arboretum. The map was created through collaboration of the Tree Watertown Group and uh, volunteer Josh Carlson. Uh, you can access the story map by using a smartphone to scan the QR code that is on the downtown Arboretum sign pictured here in the top left. This sign is located uh, near the sidewalk between the Flower Memorial Library and City Hall on Washington Street downtown. Or you can access a hyperlink that will bring you to the story map by visiting the sleloinvasives.org website. Uh, a link will also be sent to you in a follow-up email so you'll be able to find it. Uh, pictured on the bottom right here is a brochure that provides the same information as the story map that I'm going to show you. And you can get a copy uh, of the brochure and it can lead you on a tour of the Arboretum. Copies can be picked up from City Hall. Uh, they can also be downloaded from the Slilo website. And again, we will send a digital copy for you as well. So bear with me while I switch my screen mode here. Hopefully, this will behave for me. Okay. Mike, let me know if you're seeing the story map now. Not quite yet. Okay. Last time we had a bit of a lag, so. Hey, there it is. I also Excellent. see some notes too. Okay. Yep. Okay. Well, I'm not really sure why it's doing that, but <laughs> how about now? You seeing the story map? Seeing the story map. Just the map. Just the map now, yes. All right, excellent. All right, thanks for bearing with me, folks. Okay, so this is the story map that will pop up when you scan that QR code or you know, if you go to the link that I mentioned. Um, and as you can see, this is downtown Watertown. There's a square right here to just kind of orientate everybody here. The Arboretum, it, it lies between Stone Street and Sterling Street here. Um, and the way you can navigate it is down here along the bottom, I hope you can see my cursor, you can click on these different tree icons here and it will bring you to the corresponding number um, where the tree is located on the map. So I'm going to go ahead and click on one here, this tulip tree. Oh, maybe we'll pick a different one. Okay. Oh, all right. So I have to zoom in. So you can zoom in here by hitting the little arrows and see how it kind of popped up. So. You see the difference there, how it's popping up. Um, and then you can zoom in and then a nice little dialog box opens up and it gives you information about that specific tree. Uh, another way you can navigate the map is say you're, you're downtown uh, and you're using the, the story map on your smartphone or something and you want it to give you a guided tour and you wanna pick the trees that you wanna learn about because you're near one of them. So you can do that as well by just selecting the number that is near where you're at, and it will tell you what kind of tree it is. Also, uh, there are signs in front of the trees that are featured on uh, this map downtown, at least most of them. Um, the city is working on uh, emphasizing some more of the trees, but there's also signs downtown as well, and that also gives you information about the trees. Uh, I wanted to note that this area here, this, this block right here, the trees that are located on both sides of Washington Street, they're not yet in this story map, but they will be added. In addition to that, there will be information about invasive forest pests that are threatening, threatening the trees in the Arboretum and in urban forest in general. So that information is forthcoming. But this gives you a really great um, tool to use, you know, go visit the Arboretum, get a guided tour, learn all about the beautiful trees in our Arboretum. I'm going to get back to our presentation here. Bear with me. Let me know when you see it. 
Looks like you're back. Okay. And although Mike does love all the trees in the Arboretum, I did want to give him just a brief moment here to showcase some of his favorites. So he's going to go ahead and point out a few of his favorites so you can visit downtown in the Arboretum. This, uh, this is a, it's a tulip tree here. This is uh, just a wonderful uh, large tree here. This is located, as it states, on the grounds of the Jefferson County Historical Society, which, which we encourage that, that, you, that you visit. There are many trees on that, on that property, but this one really stands out um, as, as one of the larger, more stately trees. Really, really, really beautiful silhouette-esque leaf and an even more beautiful flower. Um, that, that comes out annually. So this is just a really great uh, one to, to, to check out. You can't miss it. Um, love this tree. Yeah, it's very majestic standing in front of it too. Another one, is, you could certainly call this majestic um, and, and unique, the ginkgo biloba. Uh, this is across the street. This is uh, in on the grounds of the uh, Washington Street apartments or the Washington Street properties. Um, this is the, to my knowledge, this is the largest ginkgo uh, in the city of Watertown. Uh, not exactly sure of the uh, date of, of planting. We had done some research trying to find that, but uh, uh, this is quite old, uh, you know, certainly is at least as old as the building and the building's been there uh, for quite a long time. Um, just a beautiful tree, beautiful. Uh, this tree is this Dawn Redwood, uh, like the ginkgo, um, they're living fossils. They're, they were thought to have been extinct. Um, uh, this the Dawn Redwood was thought to be extinct until I believe the 1940s when it was discovered um, in Western China, um, and then uh, has been dispersed and planted throughout different different parts of the world. But this this tree um, is special to me. Um, for one, it, it, it will be a future giant um, in the right conditions. This tree can grow up to 150 feet tall. Um, but uh, uh, it was a favorite tree of a, a good, good friend and um, mentor, uh, Brian Skinner of, of National Grid um, and the New York State Urban Forestry Council who, who passed um, a couple years ago. And, but this, this is one of his favorite trees. So we, we wanted to make sure to, um, to plant one in, in memory of him and, and as, it, as it grows, uh, continue to shine his memory. So all, all the hard work that he did uh, as an arborist and, and for urban forestry throughout New York State and, and beyond. So this is just a, a great one. Real quick, I, without, without pictures, just wanna name a few other uh, trees that I think you're really gonna enjoy. There's a, there's a magnificent weeping beech tree, um, a great bur oak, black walnut, there's three unique Corn, uh, Cornell unique oak trees um, throughout the Arboretum. Um, an Eastern Redbud, English oak, I could go on and on, Saucer Magnolia, there's some really, really great specimen here. Excellent, and this is also a great example of what the sign looks like. So if you see uh, just a simple post with, with a information sign on it, then you know that you're looking at a tree that's featured in the Arboretum. <clears throat> Okay, so to help protect the trees in the Arboretum, the City of Watertown is asking community members to volunteer to adopt a tree to monitor for and report signs of invasive pests and help water the many street trees in Watertown. And as Mike mentioned earlier, you can also um, sign up to have a tree planted in your yard as well. Uh, we will provide a link to a Google form to sign up to volunteer to adopt a tree in the follow-up email, or you can email me directly at the email that's on the slide um, if you are interested in, in helping to monitor for the invasive pests um, portion of this Adopt-a-Tree program. And pictured here is an excellent place to relax in the Arboretum, located right out back of the Historical Society. Um, and I just want to pause for just a moment to see if anybody has any questions about the story map, the Arboretum, or volunteer opportunity. Um, please do unmute yourself because it appears that I cannot see the chat box when I'm sharing my screen. So if you want to talk, or if Robert or Mike can see the chat box, um, feel free to call out any questions that may have popped up, please. Hey Megan. Yeah. 
Hi, I was wondering if you could talk a little bit more about what's involved with the volunteer opportunities. Yeah, kind definitely. Of commitment. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so um, more information is going to be sent out, uh, but it's pretty much if you will volunteer to monitor for signs. Um, Robert's going to go over the signs of infestation and, and the insects that we're um, asking folks to keep an eye out for next. Um, and if you visit the tree that you adopt um, in the arboretum uh, in the spring, in the fall, and or summer, and then again in the fall, and then you take pictures of anything that you see that looks like a sign, and then you're going to email them to uh, Mike DeMarco. So when folks sign up, they're actually going to get more details uh, about what exactly they're expected to do. But that is essentially what it's going to be in a nutshell. And then if you want to volunteer to water, Mike will be the one to um, tell you which trees he needs help watering. Um, and then if you want to volunteer to have a tree actually planted in your yard, um, Mike will be the one to give more information on that as well. So. Um, Right now, we're just giving the opportunity for folks to sign up, and then from there, we'll allocate more information um, that is needed for them to do what they volunteered to do. Thank you. Yeah, thanks for asking. Hey, Megan. Yeah. I just want to point something out um, that was in, in, the, ta in the chat. Uh, uh, Jason White made a really good point um, that each specimen tree, if, if, if you folks haven't seen it in the, in the chat, each specimen tree has a, has a plaque on a, on a post in, in front of the tree um, so we, we're going to be working to, um, to maybe move a, a, a few of these, um, posts and plaques, um, to, as, as, you know, as, as trees grow and, um, you know, health changes occur over time, you know, different species kind of showcase like, Hey, I'm, I'm actually the specimen tree for, for this species. So we'll, we'll be working over time to, uh, to, uh, to move, move those plaques when, when needed and, um, we'll certainly be doing that at least on, on a couple of them this year. So thanks for that, Jason. Excellent. Are there any other questions or right now? Okay. So I'd like to welcome Robert Smith, the Terrestrial Restoration and Resiliency Coordinator with Slilo Prism, who is going to tell you about some invasive tree pests that are threatening trees in our region. Uh, if you do volunteer to adopt a tree, you will use this information to help monitor for the presence of these pests. Robert, I'm just giving you control now. Um, all right. Robert, if you're speaking, we can't hear you. All right, let me see if I can do something on my side. Technical difficulties for a minute here. I got it, the mute was on. Oh, yeah, I was just trying to get to it, but my cursor wouldn't move. <laughs> Thank you, Robert. Yeah, you're welcome. All right. Uh, hello, everybody. Uh, I, I, I am going to discuss uh, four invasive pests that are uh, threatening our uh, urban forests. Uh, three of these are not currently in the Salilo region, uh, but they could arrive anytime. Uh, those are uh, Asian longhorn uh, beetle, spotted lanternfly, and hemlock woolly adelgid. One I'm going to discuss, emerald ash borer, I'm sure you all know, is currently causing problems to our region. Uh, I will be including uh, some information about the current and long-term management strategies in my discussion of uh, EAB. Ah. Let me just a second. All right, um, spotted lanternfly. Spotted lanternfly appearance varies greatly according to uh, life stage. 
Uh, early stage nymphs are black with uh, white spots. Um, they're, uh, but you know, before they transform into a winged adults, they'll 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 actually turn red, which you can see there in the upper right. Um, as adults, uh, they are uh, one inch long by a half inch uh, wide, with light brown to grayish colored forewings and red hind wings with uh, black spots. Uh, their upper wing portions are uh, dark with uh, with uh, white stripes. So they're, they're actually, uh, you know, kind of pretty actually, but not good for our uh, region. Um, the uh, target species uh, include a, a variety of trees uh, and other plants such as uh, hops, grapevine, black walnut, um, maple trees, uh, tulip trees, oaks, and many different kinds of fruit trees. Um, its preferred host is an invasive uh, tree species called uh, Tree of Heaven, which I'll talk to you about, about in a couple slides. Spotted lanternfly adults and nymphs uh, use their piercing mouth parts to suck uh, plant sap. Uh, this makes their, uh, their host tree vulnerable to disease and attack from other insects. Um, they also swarm host plants and feed by the thousands, uh, sec secreting an unpleasant, unpleasant sticky uh, honeydew, as it's known. Uh, this honeydew uh, attracts mold that interferes with the photosynthesis of that uh, host plant. Um, this directly interferes with crop yields in the case of fruit trees. Uh, signs of infestation include uh, sap oozing or weeping from wounds are uh, on host plants that uh, are, they'll appear wet and they may uh, they might give off a, a fermented odor. Um, also, the presence of egg masses that are one inch long and appear to be brownish gray and waxy or are uh, brown and scaly. Uh, also, uh, honey, there's, there might be a massive honeydew buildup under the plants. Uh, sometimes the, the honeydew buildup will have a black uh, sooty mold. All right, as was already mentioned, uh, Tree of Heaven is uh, Spotter and Lanternfly's preferred host. This tree is listed as an invasive species and is often an urban weed tree. Um, you know, it has uh, uh, pinnately compound uh, leaves. So, you know, the leaflets are perpendicular to the leaf stem. Um, and there's a, a range of 10 to 40 leaflets per leaf. Um, the, the leaves, right, are arranged alternate along the branch, um, and it's sometimes confused with a, their, with a sumac uh, or a black walnut, but um, these, these next features I mentioned there, you'll see in the pictures, that's what you need to look at um, so that you can distinguish Tree of Heaven from a, uh, from a black walnut. Or, or a, uh, or from a sumac. One is the uh, protruding bumps, also known as glandular teeth, on the base of the leaflets. Uh, if you look at the bottom left picture, you'll see those at the base of the leaflets. Uh, you will not see that on a, on a sumac or a black walnut. So that is a really good feature to look for. Uh, bark that res resembles the uh, skin of cantaloupe as is, you see in the uh, top right picture, um, up to 300,000 seeds. So you're just going to see masses of seeds on this, on this plant, which you can see in the bottom right picture. Um, and if you crush the leaves or any other portion of the plant, uh, it'll give off a strong offensive odor. 
Um, it's also allopathic, which means it, it toxifies the soil, making it uh, difficult for other plants to grow. Asian longhorn beetle. Uh, Asian longhorn beetles are bullet-shaped uh, bullet bodies. Uh, they're, they're, and their bodies are uh, a shiny black color with uh, white spots, as you can see in the picture. And they have a uh, black and white striped antenna that are uh, one and a half to two and a half times the length of the body. And the body is about, um, that length's about three quarters to uh, one and a half inches. Um, Asian longhorn beetle targets a wide variety of trees such as maples, ash, birch, elm, horse chestnut, buckeye, golden rain tree, London plane trees, sycamores. And that's, uh, that's actually uh, several of the trees that are in the arboretum. So it, it's, it's not something we want obviously to be here. Um, beetle larvae tunnel and girdle uh, the tree stems and the branches. Uh, this, look, this causes a dieback of the, tr of the tree crown and then eventual death of the tree. Um, Actually, according to uh, USDA uh, uh, APHIS, uh, they, they said that uh, ALB had, has the potential to cause more damage than Dutch elm disease, chestnut blight, and gypsy moss combined. That really does say something. Uh, signs of infestation include uh, chewed round depressions in the bark of, a, of the tree, uh, sap oozing from egg laying sites and exit holes. Uh, pencil size, perfectly round tree exit holes. You know, as opposed to the emerald ash with the D-shaped, these are more of a, you know, O-shaped, round. Uh, they have excessive, uh, you might see excessive sawdust known as frass buildup near tree bases. Our, um, Leaves that, you know, that is when it's not fall, so they're unseasonably yellowed, or the leaves are all drooping. But there's no real reason why that would be. It's not fall. There's not an extreme drought going on or anything like that. Um, that could be a potential sign of Asian longhorn beetles being present. Hemlock woolly adelgid. Uh, overwhelming, overwintering adult females are, are uh, black in color, oval, and soft-bodied. Um, they're approximately two millimeters long and are usually concealed under white woolly masses of wax. Um, the, you know, the best time to observe them is in the winter when you can see these white woolly masses of wax. Um, that's when the uh, our, uh, CELO, uh team goes out on their uh, HWA surveys is in the, in the winter because that's the best time to do the detections. The uh, the target species of hemlock woolly adelgid on the east coast are eastern and Carolina hemlock. Uh, juvenile uh, hemlock woolly adelgid uh, tap into the trees starches through the bases of the needles and uh, dis uh, disrupts the flow of the nutrients to the needles. Uh, this disruption leads to the death uh, of the needles and twigs and the tree health eventually declines after the initial infestation and this usually leads to death of a tree in anywhere from four to ten years. Robert? Yes, it's like oh, the, okay. it was going forward one. It's like I needed to go back. I wasn't finished. Yeah. 
Signs of infestation include uh, white woolly masses at the base of hemlock uh, needles attached to twigs. Um, like I said before, it's best to observe that during the winter time. You may also see gray tinted needles and um, needle loss and um, needles or, or massive amounts of needles coming off the branch, otherwise known as branch dieback. Um. Next slide. Yes, please. All right, emerald ash borer. Emerald ash borer is a metallic emerald green wood boring pest that is native to uh, parts of Asia. They're about 0.3 to 0.5 inches in length and affect all ash trees. Uh, the larval form of these insects uh, feed between the bark and the sapwood. Um, this disrupts the uh, flow of the nutrients and water in the tree. You know, this leads to uh, dieback of the branches and eventual death of the tree. Uh, so far, emerald ash borers, borer has killed at least ten, tens of millions of trees in 30 states. Some signs of infestation include uh, D-shaped holes on the bark, which you can see in that bottom right picture, uh, or X-shaped galleries, top or the top picture. Um, you know, S-shaped galleries will be under the bark. Uh, you'll see uh, leaf died back, yellowing, browning. Uh, increased woodpecker activity, that's something to look for. Uh, blonding, or uh, large strips of bark just coming off the tree. And then if you look at the top left picture, uh, that is epicormic branching. You see at the, towards the lower portion of that picture, where branches are just kind of coming off the main trunk like that, that is another sign that your tree is potentially infested with emerald ash borer. All right, next slide. Currently, there are three options for managing emerald ash borer. Chemical treatment. Chemical treatment is for ash trees that have special significance to the community. Now, and that could be a range of all kinds of things, but if it has a special significance to the community, then that's what chemical treatment there is, uh, there is intended for. Because uh, insecticides are applied every one to two, year, two years, and it's, uh, it's too expensive and time consuming for communities to apply to every ash tree. Um, insecticides should only be applied to healthy trees, uh, not those in decline. Uh, like storm damaged trees, or trees that were planted uh, inappropriately, um, where they're eventually going to grow out of the space they're in. Um, there's actually many common insecticides, metachloroprid, dinotofurin, mectin, benzoate. There's many different insecticides that you can use, and many different application methods from trunk injection, soil injection, basal bark spray, um, tree removal, that's option two. And this is for trees that would become hazardous, hazardous if infested and are not of special significance. Uh, for urban areas, um, this would, be, you know, it would become, the, the trees would become hazardous if infested uh, in most of the areas. <laughs> there's just, there's, there's something they're gonna land on. And so typically that's, that, that is a solution if you're not gonna chemically treat, is to remove the tree. Um, but there is a third option. Oh, let me add one more note on tree removal. Oh, tree removal should be removed prior to infestation there or as, early as possible when infested. Good. And the reason for that is infested trees become very brittle and difficult to remove safely. So, you know, for communities that are running into emerald ash borers, their problem right now, or it's soon to come into their community, it's like there, you, you gotta kind of make your choices 
real quick because as soon as it comes in, uh, you know, the trees could get to a state where they're going to be difficult to remove. Um, on to option three. Uh, doing nothing is a, is a third option, but it's typically for uh, it's for, it's for trees that will not become a hazard when infested. Which, as I said, most of an urban area that's not going to happen. They're going to run into or they're going to land on something. Uh, this is more of a rural option, uh, but can be applied in urban in an urban environment. If say you had a park that had a large forested area in it, uh, where you know where where that you you were pretty certain that that tree wasn't going to come down on something, then you could use that as a there you could uh, choose do nothing as your option for that ash tree or trees. Um, and you can actually use these trees, you can monitor these trees to see if they uh, have any natural resistance, which I will go to in the, uh, and discuss in the next slide. Long-term long solutions to this problem do exist. One of these involves the monitoring and managing uh, ASH program. This program involves actively gathering information concerning uh, resistant ash trees. You know, they usually they if you go to their website, you'll see they have like a certain standard, like you need like 30, 40 trees within a given area. And there's a bunch of uh, standard information you have to fill out for each tree. Um, you know, over time, it's like they'll they'll see if uh, if any of these trees after the infestation show resistance to emerald ash borer. And what they're gonna do is they're gonna cross those resistant trees to create uh, emerald ash borer resistant trees that um, can be then introduced back into the urban, suburban and rural areas. Um, Biocontrol is another option uh, with the goal of limiting the population of EAB in the same manner the uh, native pest populations um, are uh, limited by their predators. Uh, this obviously will not eliminate EAB, but it should be, it, it, what it should do is allow a younger generation of ash tree to reach maturity and thrive. Uh, currently there, there are four uh, hymenopteran parasitoids approved for uh, release. Uh, these parasitoids, which you'll see the list you see the list right there on the screen. They'll um, attack the eggs or larvae of uh, EAB, which seriously depletes the uh, future population. Okay, thank you, Robert. You're welcome. Uh, does anyone have any questions about the invasive pests that Robert just covered? Um, also, if you do choose to monitor a tree for invasive pests, you will be given information on what to look for and how to report sightings. I'm not seeing anything in the chat box right now. We can always loop back around uh, later on if something comes to mind. Um, so I'd actually like to welcome back Mike uh, to give us a brief overview of how the city of Watertown is responding to the presence of Emerald Ash Borer through strategic management of ash trees within public and city owned property. Thanks, Megan. Uh, yeah, as you, as you see here, these, these four, um, these four um, items on, on this list, community outreach, strategic treatment and removal of ash trees, as well as replanting, those are our main, um, that is our main strategy um, for combating um, the emerald ash borer and, and risks. Uh, associated with that as, as well as uh, the impacts to our to our neighborhoods okay um, public outreach is a is a key component to this um, strategy um, the city of Watertown and, and the city's tree tree advisory board tree Watertown has been uh, working with um, Cornell cooperative extension uh, as well as Slilo prism uh, National Grid, private tree care company, um, 
and other partners. I'm sorry if I'm leaving, leaving folks out here, um, Jefferson County Soil and Water Conservation District, just to, um, you know, over, over time, whether directly or in, indirectly, um, um, in regard to em Emerald Ash Borer, because um, all of these entities are, will, will be impacted and, and they can have an impact on, um, on helping to, to get the word out. So workshops like, like this one, uh, and one that, that was done um, uh, with Cornell Cooperative Extension um, a few months ago, uh, updating uh, press releases regularly to let, uh, let city residents know and understand um, the impacts of management of, of, em of the Emerald Ash Borer, um, you know, what, that, what these impacts could have on their, on their neighborhoods, uh, letting folks know um, when we're looking to to treat trees to let them know that you know because we, we have to let the community know that we are uh, that we're applying pesticides uh, to these trees that, that we're in, injecting them uh, letting folks know that um, that you know hey we're, we're, we're going to be taking your, your your tree down sending um, you know sending letters to property owners to let them know that a city tree adjacent to their home um, will be removed is, is an important component of this because um, although it will be disruptive to our communities, communications key. Um, city council work sessions are very important pieces of, of this uh, of this management strategy. Um, as new or different folks come into these um, these seats or these positions, um, you know, they they need to be kept abreast on on the Emerald Ash Borer and how how this can and will impact neighborhoods. Um, <clears throat> In, uh, in 2012, uh, the City Street Tree Advisory Board and members of Cornell Cooperative Extension did a citywide uh, ash tree inventory of trees, of ash trees both on publicly owned property as well as on uh, city property, um, excuse me, private property. Um, and with this information, we were able to um, send just about 200 letters uh, out to uh, private citizens to let them know that, hey, you, you have a um, you have an ash tree or at, at least one ash tree on your, on your property. Um, here is some more information about ash trees and the em emerald ash borer, as well as, you know, here are some folks that you can come in contact with certified arborists and pesticide applicators um, that can assist you in managing your privately owned ash trees. Um, as part of the 2017-2018 uh, citywide tree inventory, um, of our streets and, and our parks, uh, we found that there were uh, just over 430 publicly owned ash trees throughout the city. This map here, although you know can't see it all, it gives, it gives you a good idea um, of what we're looking at as far as some of the higher concentrated areas where, where ash trees are within our city. Just under 6% of the total tree population uh, is, a, uh, is a very manageable number. Uh, we're very lucky here that um, that uh, decision makers um, and folks uh, planting trees, you know, had the the foresight and and listening to our our statewide partners and 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 science uh, in the early 2000s to relax the planting of of ash trees in the around the 2005 timeframe, uh, and because of that, we only have just about 430 ash trees. Otherwise, we could have a significantly higher population. Of ash throughout our city. Okay, um, one of the one of the um, management strategy, uh, a piece of the of the management strategy that we will that we will uh, in, embark on and, and have already begun um, our systematic and strategic removal of, of, of ash trees. Now, um, this metric was recommended. Um, by certified arborists who completed our uh, our recent tree inventory 2017 2018 um, and as part of that in information created a citywide manage tree management plan which included an ash uh, strategy um, so they they recommended that uh, trees that we we should consider trees in less than good condition um, to be to be to be takedowns. Now, some of these trees in fair condition, especially the, the larger ones, they they certainly de 
just deserve a second and, and third look and to be monitored closely. But trees in poor condition, critical condition, um, and smaller diameter uh, trees in fair condition um, will not be considered for, for treatment. So we see here a little bit of a, a comparison of trees that are expected to be removed over the ash trees expected to be re removed over the next couple of years. Um, but then you also get to see trees that are considered treatable. Now, that doesn't mean that they all will be treated, but they're of a condition rating at the time of inventory of good or better. Uh, so this is just a little snapshot just to kind of show you, uh, the, just to, for clarity, the, the green, the green dots, those are all trees that are not ash trees, other, other species. Um, the, um, the purple are the treatable trees, and the, uh, and, and the blue are the trees to be uh, taken down. Okay, um, just to, just to kind of shift that a little, little bit and maybe a little bit of a color pers perspective here just to detail a little bit further about some of our uh, partners in, in uh, treating some of these trees. Again, uh, the trees in red uh, to be removed over the next, uh, in, during 2020 and 2021. Um, the treatable uh, ash pop population, again, all of these trees were not treated, but um, we have a great, Great partners with um, the New York State Department of Environmental Conservation um, and the Northern New York Community Foundation. Um, the New York State DEC were gracious enough to reallocate uh, $6,000 of, um, of tree planting funding towards uh, the treatment of, of ash trees. Um, and we were just thrilled. Um, we were thrilled by that and be because of that initiative in that, in that partnership between the state and the city, the Northern New York Community Foundation um, agreed to help out and they, they put up uh, $2,000. Uh, should be noted here and uh, I, I, I can't believe I didn't, I didn't put this in, but um, Phil, Phil Sprague and, and, um, and his, uh, not foundation, but his, in, he, he has an endowment program, he, he, and, he and his wife, um, they, they put $500 in, but he is a, a member of uh, Rotary. So uh, they, they, they combine this, um, this, this amount here to $2,500. We just, you know, we, we could not have done this without, uh, without these, these groups. 57 ash trees were, were treated this year. Uh, we couldn't be more proud. We couldn't be more thankful for these, these partnerships. Um, and um, this is just something that you know we're we're looking to treat as many ash trees as possible, but full knowing that um, part of the strategy will be will be takedowns. When we were evaluating our ash trees for for treatment, we knew having limited funding that we had to be really we had to really kind of scrutinize which trees were going to be treated. So. Uh, we had to we had to really look at this as you know main entrances of the city, culturally significant spaces, and also specimen ash, meaning we had to kind of pick the best of the best and the ones that were that meant something to us. Just just as um, just as Robert mentioned, you you know spaces within your city that mean something to you as a as a as a municipality, as a as a as a city within, within neighborhoods, so we, we we chose these 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 spaces. Um, Thompson Park is we had 17 trees uh, treated in, in Thompson Park. This is just a piece of the, the map here. But uh, if you're interested in learning where where some of these trees are, you can contact me, and I can I can give you a map, and you can actually visit them if you if you like. Um, but uh, this is just just an example of a, a space that we shows with cultural significance. Of course, the city's downtown Arboretum um, is a space of cultural significance here for, for folks within, within the city. So um, you, you can see here these, these purple dots here. These, were, uh, these are ash trees uh, in the downtown Arboretum that were, that were treated. Um, we're very, very thankful 
um, you can see on the picture to the right, this is, um, this is the, the same space in yesteryear. These are primarily elm trees. There may be some silver maple in there, but they're primarily elm. This is an iconic stretch of um, park-like setting that has been with the city since the time of uh, when it was a village. Um, now extra wide margins here between the, um, what, what would be the curb and the sidewalk is, has always been a park-like setting here. And so we're really, we, we, won't, we wanna keep that. Uh, we don't wanna lose um, the time that, that, these, that these ash trees have been growing. Um, so it's very, very important that, that we protect these just, just, as, just as good as we can. So um, these, will, these ash trees will certainly be um, on our list for continued plant, or excuse me, continued treatment. Thank you, Mike. Uh, so I know this topic can be a bit of a sore spot right now. No one likes to see trees cut down. Uh, thankfully, the city of Watertown is strategically and sustainably managing ash tree populations throughout the city. Uh, but if you do have some questions about what Mike just discussed, feel free to ask now. But I ask that we keep this discussion friendly and be conscious of time. Uh, we do have a few in the chat box I'll address first. Um, so folks are asking, uh, do Tree Watertown and the Thompson Park Conservancy partner on tree monitoring and management in the park? And can anyone attend the Tree Watertown meetings? And they're curious of when the meetings occur. So. We'll be sure to add that in the follow-up email too, but you can address those questions now, Mike. Mike? Hello? Did you hear me? Um, you kind of, you kind of uh, fell off a little bit. Oh, I apologize. Uh, the question is, do Tree Watertown and the Thompson Park Conservancy partner on tree monitoring and management in the park? And then there's another part to the question that you can, I'll, I'll ask sure. after. Okay. Did, did you want me to, to yeah. take that out now? Yeah, so we, yeah. Uh, the Friends of Thompson Park is the, um, is the, um, con the con conservancy group up uh, uh, that kind of, I'm not sure exactly if they oversee, um, Thompson Park, but they, they certainly have influence and they have the, the Thompson Park's best interest in, in mind. Um, we have been working with them um, at, the, at the city level um, and over, over time with, uh, with, with, with Tree Watertown. Um, I think that that partnership uh, can and will be uh, strengthened, especially with, with the, the, the Emerald Ash Borer. I think it's a, it's a kind of a, a perfect um, Partnership there, knowing where these where these ash trees are um, on a, on a map, we we have them uh, digitally in our um, and geolocated in our asset management program. Uh, I think going going forward, um, we we will absolutely be working together on this. Excellent. And yeah, as far as tree water tone goes, uh, yes, anyone can attend. Uh, uh, you know, we we ask that uh, you can contact um, either. Uh, you can find our, our contact information on, uh, on the city's website, or you can reach out to myself directly. Um, I can give you some, uh, some further in information. We ask that you come and come and check out your first meeting as a, as a guest. And if you're, if you're interested, you know, we, we don't, we don't push anyone away. You know, we're, we're always looking to, to get um, in, interested citizens in, involved and, uh, and keep uh, Watertown's urban forestry program strong. Excellent. And Mike, I'd like to add to that too, that um, there's a lot of uh, collaboration going on now for the EAB outreach through the Tree Watertown group um, specifically, right? So um, if anybody is interested in helping with um, raising awareness for EAB and um, participating in that uh, specifically by joining the Tree Watertown group, that would be appreciated. Absolutely. Okay, I don't see any other questions in the chat box, so I'm going to proceed. Um, I'd like to welcome back Robert Smith. Uh, he is going to discuss our Urban Forest Sustainability Initiative, which is aimed to help urban tree managers enhance the health of their urban forests in the path of invasive pests and a changing climate. 
All right, hello again. Um, the uh, Urban Forest Sustainability Initiative is a, a new program that Slilo Prism uh, introduced this year. Uh, you know, it is designed to assist urban communities with maintaining increasing urban forest resilience to invasive pests, pathogens, and climate change. Uh, to avoid any confusion, I know Mike brought this up earlier, when I refer to urban uh, forest, I mean all the trees found in a city and not just the ones on a sidewalk. Uh, this presentation is uh, based on Slilo Prism's Urban Forest Sustainability Guide, which goes into, a more, uh, into more detail than time will allow during uh, today's presentation. Uh, if you're interested in reading the guide, it can be found on the Slilo Prism Urban Forest webpage at the website address shown on the slide. All right, to, uh, to retain a sustainable urban forest, uh, certain basic components uh, should be considered. Um, and uh, these are uh, establishing a tree ordinance and tree board. You know, the, these provide the legal authority for uh, communities to conduct forestry programs and guide the management of community trees. Um, the urban forest, you know, sometimes known as tree management plan. Uh, this includes conducting a tree inventory, compiling and analyzing tree inventory data, and establishing the work plan and expenses required for pruning, fertilizing, uh, tree planting, and tree removals. Um, uh, urban forest preparedness plan. The preparedness plan is a new addition to urban forest programs. Um, and picks up where many tree management plans stop or, or, or are incomplete when it comes to urban forest sustainability. Uh, the remainder of the presentation, in fact, will be uh, all about the urban forest preparedness plan. Uh, tree City uh, USA, I know uh, Mike went into that a little bit too. Uh, this is a program that provides direction technical assistance, public attention, national recognition for urban communities, and it's spot sponsored by the Arbor Day Foundation in cooperation with the USDA Forest Service and the uh, New York State DEC uh, Urban and uh, Community Forest uh, Forestry Program. Uh, the Relief Program, uh, this is a partnership of professional DEC urban foresters with uh, community members and offers classes, insight, and uh, tree selection, planting, and maintenance. Uh, community science, uh, education, and outreach. Um, some people are, are, might know community science as citizen science, but they've been uh, trying to change it over to community science. Um, uh, this is community members getting involved with their urban forest uh, program, and it, can, and it allows them to contribute their talents and perform urban forest skills that they can acquire through webinar, webinars, in-person classes, and field workshops. And the last on my list is pocket parks. These, they, they, these, these some people may or may not have heard of that. They're just, they're sm these small, usually less than a quarter acre in size, open spaces in urban areas that serve um, much the same function as a city park. And they provide uh, social, economic, and environmental benefits to uh, areas that were uh, previously serving no purpose whatsoever. Uh, so here's the big question. What is a urban forest preparedness plan? It is a proactive strategy for urban forest resilience to invasive pests, pathogens, and climate change. The uh, main components of the preparedness plan are the urban forest risk assessment and urban forest health. The urban forest risk assessment considers uh, urban forest risks to, uh, you know, in uh, urban forest risks to uh, pests and, or pathogens and climate change, uh, responses to those risks and the cost of those risks. Um, it's basically a way to determine the level of damage that may occur if a certain pest or pathogen arrives in your community and how climate change will affect your urban forest. 
it allows you to compare responses and the costs associated with the response, um, all in a, a proactive, not reactive manner. Um, Urban Forest Health considers resiliency techniques such as uh, planting basics, which is about planting the right tree in the right place along with basic care and maintenance and uh, strategies for urban forest resilience to pest pathogens and climate change. All right, so what are the risks you should consider? Um, pests and pathogens, obviously you should look at, uh, there were pests and pathogens, you should look at both uh, the, uh, the current risks like emerald ash borer, you know, which affects all kinds of ash trees and future risks like uh, hemlock woolly adelgid affecting hemlocks or, or you know, or spotted lanternfly and the many hardwoods and fruit trees or ALB like I, you know, like my last presentation with the birches, elms, horse chestnut, chestnut. You should be considering all of those risks, both current and future risks. Uh, with climate change, Climate change is another risk that must be considered in the assessment. Annual mean temperatures are predicted to increase th three to eight degrees Fahrenheit in the, uh, in the New England, Northern New York area by 2100. And as you see there, it's, they've already, uh, they're in the last 110 years, saw a 2.4 degree uh, increase. Um, there's also predictions of greater winter precipitation and longer periods of summer drought. Um, these changes, changing conditions will have negative impacts on some of our northern and boreal uh, tree species. You need to know which tree species in your community are likely to do well and which will not. Um, one source that you can turn to uh, is the uh, um, <clears throat> Our, yeah, I'm sorry. Yeah. Oh, the U.S. Forest Service. The one that you can go to is the uh, USDA Forest Service uh, Climate Change Atlas, which you will see a screenshot of down at the bottom left. If you can just Google there, the uh, USDA Forest Service uh, Climate Change Atlas pops right up. And that, that will, uh, what they do is they provide a rating for climate change adaptability for each tree species. Next slide. As you are determining your risks for invasive pests, pathogens, and climate change, uh, you should uh, summarize the risks to your urban forest uh, by you know, create, creating some kind of record like a spreadsheet uh, with the trees, that uh, with a list of the trees that are present in your urban forest uh, and the uh, pests and pathogens that will affect them. You know, uh, also information about climate change adaptability of these tree species should be included. Uh, once this information is gathered, um, you know, responses to these risks should be determined and the cost of those responses. Um, you should also uh, include costs of lost, eco lost ecosystem services. Um, that could be uh, calculated uh, using iTree. If you go to iTreeTools.org, uh, it's a good site there to determine um, how much the services uh, your trees in your, in your urban forest are providing. And you can, you, you can take off whatever chunk is that you would lose from you know, loss of say ash trees from emerald ash borer, what have you. Um, these uh, uh, results can uh, then be summarized in uh, a risk assessment report that can be used um, by city officials as, a, as both an information and a de decision making tool. Um, these anticipated costs um, can also be included in your uh, community's annual budget proposal. Um, you know, for removals, replacement, insecticide treatments. Uh, 
having a risk assessment is a proactive approach to dealing with invasive pests, pathogens, and climate change. And the big advantage with using a proactive approach is that it mitigates the risk through uh, advanced planning and funding that decreases the financial strain associated with a reactive approach and decreasing the number of vulnerable tree species planted, uh, which further decreases the final impact from the invasive pest pathogen and climate change. If you, if you anticipate a loss from uh, there from, uh, you know, from emerald ash borer for ash, you know, and ashes, you're probably not going, they're, they're going to start planting a bunch of ash trees. So you're, that's going to minimize your risk there. Next slide. Uh, maintaining urban forest health should always start with the basics. Tree species are adapted to the conditions where they naturally occur and will do better or do best under these conditions. This is a fact that needs to be considered when planting trees in urban communities. Uh, so how can we help uh, ensure the health of the trees in this uh, human constructed landscape? Uh, we need to just consider the environmental variables on the ground, like pH, salinity, available sunlight, moisture level, soil type, cold hardiness, um, you know, when deciding which trees to plant and where to plant them. Um, basic care and maintenance, like uh, watering, uh, pruning, applying a mulch, and preventing soil compaction around the trees uh, is also important to the health of these trees. And, you know, healthy trees are going to be more resilient trees. Uh, this is what is typically called right tree, right place by urban foresters. And it saves the municipality as, uh, money and time by preventing, by preventing the need for pruning, you know, branches growing into the road, building power lines, and uh, removal of poor health or dead trees and those that are growing outside of their urban boundaries. All right, the next urban forest strategy is increasing uh, resilience to invasive pests and pathogens. Strategies that add resilience to the urban forest include increasing species and age diversity. Uh, species diversity, uh, you know, decreases the chance that a single invasive species will seriously damage your forest. For example, if most of your urban forest uh, consisted of ash trees, EAB would, would cause the loss of most of your urban forest. Uh, age diversity uh, balances the uh, strengths that trees exhibit at different uh, stages of life and um, limits the number of aging more susceptible trees. So while older trees are typically more drought tolerant because their roots are straight, or go deep into, you know, into the ground, um, you know, they, they may be less resistant to um, invasive pests and pathogen damage from, 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 their, uh, from you know, their old uh, age. Um, so basically more diversity equals more resilience. Another resilient strategy is selecting less vulnerable tree species. This strategy is about avoiding those species that have current invasive pests and pathogen problems or will likely have problems in the near future. Uh, one source I found, and I'm sure there's many others, it's like, but one source I found that I liked uh, to, you know, for, uh, that I think would be helpful is a study uh, published in Global Ecology and Conservation by uh, Potter et al. Um, they, uh, they, they are three of the uh, trees in our area that they, uh, or more than three of count ashes, there uh, as being multiple, but uh, three were, that were rated highest for insect and disease morality are ashes, hemlocks, uh, butternut. Some people aren't aware of butternut canker, but that's, that, that, that's a lethal disease that, that there's no solution for. Uh, so we already discussed the problems with hemlock and ashes. Uh, ones that they mentioned, and this is not all of them on the list, it's just three I grabbed, 
uh, that were rated, uh, but, but they were rated lowest for insect and disease vulnerability is pitch pine, river birch, and black gum. So those are three that you know that you might want to consider uh, in your uh, urban forest inventory. Um, another forest health strategy is having early detection and a rapid response team actively pursuing and eradicating invasive species. The easiest and most cost effective way of managing invasive pests and pathogen is to catch them early and eradicate them quickly. Eradication methods include applications of insecticides or fungicides or in uh, some cases like uh, oak wilt disease, complete tree removal. Another resilience strategy that I would like to emphasize er, and, and Slilo Prism's been promoting is adding diversity with native tree species. There are many native trees to choose from that can be placed into the urban environment according to suitability. You know, right tree, right place. Um, native trees also have many benefits, including, you know, supporting local wildlife. Native wildlife prefer native trees for food and shelter. Um, they're also low maintenance. According to the DEC, uh, when compared to non-natives, they require less water, little or no fertilizer, little to no pesticides, less pruning, and thus less of your time. Um, they're also unlikely to, to ever become invasive or overly competitive with other native plants. Saying all that, I want to be clear that this program is not saying you should not plant non-native tree species. It's just promoting greater diversity by also considering native tree species because most non-native tree species, as you probably know, uh, that are used in urban areas are not invasive and are fine to use to add diversity to your urban forest. I do recommend though that Communities do some research into tree species they are not familiar with that are non-native before purchasing them to ensure they have not showed invasiveness in other communities. The uh, last urban uh, health concern I will discuss today is resilience to uh, climate change. As I mentioned earlier in the presentation, the uh, future climate is predicted to be uh, warmer with greater winter precipitation, longer periods of summer drought. Uh, one strategy uh, to sustain urban forests through these changes is to increase species diversity. Since trees, uh, they're you know, um, or since trees come in a range of uh, drought and flood tolerance levels, creating a more diverse forest will minimize the risk of substantial tree canopy and ecosystem service loss by distributing that, the risks among multiple species. Because if you go all with, uh, all with drought tolerant or more flood tolerant and you get a big amount of the one or the other, you're gonna have, you, you're, you know, the probability of having a large loss is greater. Uh, another strategy is to increase age diversity. Uh, Tree vulnerability varies with age. You know, you know uh, younger trees uh, may not be so good with drought, but they tend to be more tolerant of uh, storm-related uh, winds. So more severe storms in the future because of climate change, having a, uh, there are enough younger trees in your urban forest could uh, retain your ecosystem services and your urban forest, uh, you know, intact, at least most of it. Uh, older trees, though, when it's if it's really droughty, the roots are deep in the soil. You know they're 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 going to be the ones that are going to be doing well, and you're still retaining your urban forest by having a mix of age classes in your urban forest. You're distributing the risks among those age classes, and retaining the benefits uh, related um, to uh, having a, an urban forest. Well, uh, that concludes my presentation. Um, I uh, appreciate all who are on listening. Um, if you have any questions for me whatsoever, I will try to get you there the best answer I can. 
or help you out as best I can, you can email me at robert.l.smith at tnc.org, or you can give me a call, which you'll have right now, I'm not working from the office, so you'll have to leave a message if you do. Uh, it's 315-387-3600. Uh, Extension 7723. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you, Robert. Um, I do want to uh, check the chat box here and see if anybody had any uh, questions for what we just covered with the Urban Forest Sustainability Initiative, or if folks want to take themselves off mute, feel, feel free to do that. Okay, and I'd like to take a moment to thank each of you again for joining us today. Urban forests provide immense beauty and benefits for both people and nature. All the street trees and vegetation that provide green spaces in our concrete jungles we all call home are often taken for granted when they need to be celebrated. Next time you are walking downtown or riding in a car, I want to invite you to take a look at the trees around you and just think about how different it would be if they weren't there. Uh, we hope you will pledge to protect these trees by volunteering to help keep an eye out for invasive pests and also by taking time to help give water to our trees. Uh, you can contact us with any further questions or comments at the emails and numbers listed on this slide. A follow-up email with resources from today's discussion and continuing education credit info will be sent out early next week. And unless anybody else has any questions or comments, that will conclude our presentation today. Thank you and enjoy the rest of your day. Thanks, folks. Right, thanks.